Your sensors are correct. Do not adjust your heading. Your heading. You've discovered the Omega Particle. Streaming to the Alpha Quadrant and beyond. 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 Here's your host. The Anchorman of the Federation. The Doctor of Dilithium. This is Jonathan Wiegand. Welcome, all you intellectuals, conversationalists, and thrill seekers. This is the Omega Particle Podcast, and you know me, it's OPP. I'm your harmless little triple of a host, Jonathan Wiegand, with talent on loan from God. <laughs> we are streaming across the fruited plain that is known as the Alpha Quadrant, and boy, oh boy, do we have a show for you today. This one actually took me a lot longer to review and write than I anticipated. It's probably taken me about six weeks to kind of get all the books and and, and read through and then write my script and and how in-depth do I want to be, etc. But never fear, we are here to talk about the Primate Directive. So if you're reading the episode title and you've clicked play... You must be thinking, has the Anchorman of the Federation gone completely bananas? Well, I promise you, I have not. So you're going to take your serious hats on. or I don't know Luna. Luna the intern, everybody. Your serious hat, whether they're fedoras or like, I don't know what a serious hat is. But you're going to take those, you're going to take them off and put them down. Because this is absolutely bananas. And I, I know I've used that pun twice now. So forgive me, but I'm going to quit monkeying around and we're going to get to the topic. But I want you to know this is very silly that we're reviewing. I mean, the title of it is the Primate Directive, a pun on the Prime Directive. And this is a comic series from IDW. And if you're not a fan of Planet of the Apes, it's it's one of the most OG sci-fi franchises out there. And if you're not a fan that, you know, this comic and this series may not be for you. You may just not get as much tickles and enjoying the little, the inside jokes that you would get if you've seen, you know, uh, for the first couple movies of the uh, Planet of the Apes. And I'm talking old school movies, like from the 60s, not the new ones with the prequel ones with Andy Serkis. But those are good, too. Don't, don't knock those, but. One thing I love about the Planet of the Apes movies is that, you know, the higher you go in the number, I think I think there's a six of them, the original ones, there's like six of them, the higher you go up that number, the lower the budget gets. So, so the first one is just an all-time, you know, cinematic classic. You have Charleston Heston, you have his great acting and, and flailing about and his cursing in 1960s si- in style where he's like, damn! Like, you know, like, that is a classic like sci-fi movie the sixth one of planet of the apes looks like it was filmed in somebody's backyard it is just in a giant field and there's like a bunch of tree houses and that's all you really kind of get you don't really get anything more no cool scenery no it's just kind of it is what it is so again they're not very critically acclaimed once you get past the first one but never fear and we're going to be talking about the primate directive comic series today And there are some interesting in-depth tropes that we're going to cover, especially talking about, you know, the futuristic viewpoint and optimistic viewpoint that Star Trek has combating and in direct opposition to the skeptical cynicism that we see in the ape franchise about humanity's future. So it's, it's definitely a exact extremes. You know, one is where we have no money, nobody argues, everybody's cool. And the other one, we blow up the damn planet. <laughs> I can say damn as much as I want because Charleston Heston said it and he played Moses. So get off my back, Luna. You're just the intern. So it's you have these two massive swings on the scale of humanity. And we will cover all of that and more on the Primate Directive review. Luna, let's light this candle. So starting off, we have this very noble attempt 
to hook up these two like sci-fi titans and i mean this is very interesting and when i saw this comic randomly on amazon i thought it was fake i was like this no this is not real right and oh it's real ladies and gentlemen it's real you have the two biggest science fiction franchises to ever come out of the 1960s enormously popular you know with the genre you have the toys you have the comics you have the spin-offs and the sequels and they're enormously loved and endearing works and personal favorites of mine like i said i've watched them all multiple times even though they don't get better in quality they're still great campy 1960s sci-fi and that's that's really good so i i enjoy that and i'm sure a lot of you do too because you're cool people and a brilliant audience it's called buttering up the audience luna get off my back sorry luna's she's sassy in these like non strange new world episodes so anyway and that that's a little plug we are reviewing strange new world so if you haven't listened to that jump on the bandwagon we just got done with episode three so feel free but moving on to kind of cover what these two franchises are all about so the original planet of the apes film is a story by by it's a story about george taylor and he's like this surly astronaut who goes into space in search of something greater than man and his ship crashes on a mysterious planet where apes are the rulers and mankind literally the animals and mankind can't speak we can't do anything complex we're kind of just this animal using this framework they kind of explore these bigger issues and if that rings a bell in sci-fi it should so apes in the original movie they they talk about religion and war and the nature of man etc etc and they use that in the context of current day so they comment on the current status of the 60s while under the scope of ape human relations in the 19 in planet of the apes so now star trek I'm sure as you guys know listening to a star trek podcast you know we're we're very optimistic about the future that we are going out and getting better And so Star Trek, the original series, is about the Enterprise and Captain Kirk and the crew, you know, seeking out new life, new civilizations, and generally going where no no one has gone before. So it kind of makes sense that you can see the logic of putting these two things together. Indeed, going to a planet controlled by apes is exactly what I would expect to watch on the original series. You know, I mean, they've done everything so wild. They went back to Rome and they had you know, Greek gods and all this kind of wild stuff in the original series that wouldn't surprise me to see a planet controlled by apes and humans are treated like animals. Like I mentioned before, Star Trek has always used sci-fi concepts to tackle bigger ideas and speak on current day things. And so it actually fits very well to apes in that regard. And I think this is going to be interesting. Like I said, we're going to take our serious hats off and hopefully uh, have some fun and maybe talk about some bigger issues here. But I mean, the title's called Primate Directive. You know what you're getting. Like, it's like going to a place called The Electric Cowboy and it be full of dishes. It just doesn't make any sense. It needs to be full of young cowboys who are ready to have a good time, not full of dishes. So I Primate Directive is exactly what we get. And that is an incredibly inside joke that maybe only five people will get. And none of those people listen to this podcast. So do not worry about that or Google that place in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Anyway, we are going into what could possibly go wrong when you mix these two franchises together. So Trek and Apes come from fundamentally different places about planet Earth, the worlds they portray. And it's going to be very difficult to kind of reconcile these franchises and combine these franchises but primate directive does it in the normal comic way star trek takes place in the future and on earth but this one isn't controlled by tyrannical orangutans or anything getting into what happens in the primate directive we see the end of the first film which is taylor slamming his fist into the sand saying damn you damn you you blew it up and Meaning, like, humanity blew up the Earth. 
we killed off humanity, almost all of humanity, and that's how the movie ends. It's a massive spoiler. And so that is the setting of the end of Planet of the Apes. And this comic kind of goes between the fir- end of the first film, the beginning of the second, and almost the beginning of the third. And we'll cover how that happens. So the comic opens up on a gorilla general. Now, when I say gorilla general for the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'm talking about an actual gorilla. <laughs> Not like gorilla warfare general, an actual gorilla. Harambe general. Maybe she's should call it Harambe general. Um, so anyway, this gorilla general is meeting with this secret shadowy figure, and he's getting advanced weaponry from this shadowy figure. Now, the general is just tickled pink. Because he's like, hey, with these weapons, I can rule the planet of the apes. Which, who talks like that? Like, I can rule the planet of the humans. Like, or I can rule the planet of the Klingons. Just doesn't have the same ring to it. And if you didn't know, because you just are brand new to Star Trek, the Klingons are the sworn enemy of the United Federation of Planets until the Kittimer Accords, which have not been signed yet. So I don't need a bunch of emails explaining how the timeline's wrong. No, this is pre-Kittimer, so back off. (laughs) Uh, Where was I now? I got all worked up by the Kittimer records. The Enterprise crew members, Sula and Yohora, are kind of on this undercover mission on the home planet of Klingons, which is Kronos, and they're, you know, it's a touch-and-go spy mission. It's super dangerous, and they're trying to steal this data that the Federation needs, and they escape with it, and they head back to the Enterprise, and and they get back to the Enterprise, they kind of go over all this intel, and they discover that the Cleons, are you ready for this, are using a device to transport to alternate dimension. And that's it. So if you're like, how are they going to bring these two worlds together? And it's like, well, duh, a device that can transport you to an alternate dimension. Don't ask any questions. It works. <laughs> so that's where we are. And moving directly on, so they, they have this alternate dimension device, And the Enterprise kind of goes to investigate and look into possibly what the Klingons could be doing this. And they actually find their way into an alternate dimension doing that. And they find themselves orbiting the planet Earth, but not the planet Earth they know. It's the planet of the Earth from Planet of the Apes. So they beam down to the planet, the crew of the Enterprise, and they're shocked to learn, hey, this isn't our Earth. Something's wrong. It's got some got some more ape in it than I'm used to and makes me just the way it was written, it makes me think like like you're at a restaurant and you're like, waiter, there's a hair in my soup. It's like waiter, there's too many apes on my planet. So that's kind of the vibe I got. And worse yet, we now know that this and I'm sure you probably figured this out because you're a very smart, beautiful audience, is that the Klingons were those shattery figures arming the gorilla general and trying to create this coup and the reason why is because we need a comic that's why (laughs) remember i said the thing about the serious hats yeah this is one of those parts Uh, so anyway the enterprise away party they get into this they beam down and they start looking around and they're like okay this is our our earth something's obviously wrong and these apes are very intelligent they can like process thought and they, and they have language skills and they, they get into kind of this scuffle and I guess it's like a, almost an obligation at this point to for them to kind of figure out hey these apes are smart and fast and stronger than us humans but either way there's a bunch of phaser fire and then they beam back to the Enterprise and they're like well, well that escalated quickly like what the heck happened and come to the realization you know these apes are roughly comparable to humans in our own universe and they figure, okay, if these apes have basic, you know, phasers and kind of that type of weaponry, we know the Klingons are arming them, and that can't happen. So Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Chekhov, in a surprise edition of the attractive zoologist, which I didn't know Federation ships had zoologists. I mean, they have botanists. Shout out to Keiko O'Brien. But they have zoologists, because you never know when you would need one on an away mission. And so they beam right to the foot of the famous destroyed Statue of Liberty. That's kind of where we leave the Enterprise crew. And the comic 
like I mentioned before, takes place right after the original Planet of the Apes movie. So we already know the characters, you know, the chimpanzees, Cornelius and Zira, the orangutan, Dr. Sayas, and the human Taylor from the first film, the surly astronaut that we've talked about before. Taylor now, you know, after he gave his big, you blew it up speech, damn you. And he's like out in society walking around in the wilderness because he's distraught to know this is actually his earth. So right after that, the Enterprise crew finds him. And he, Taylor, of course, is with his companion Nova, who is mute, so she can't speak. On And so they, the Enterprise crew finds him on a beach. And this is where the meeting of Trek's optimism and ape cynicism should have just been fireworks. And it was for a little bit. And this is kind of where I was a little disappointed. I wish there was more in-depth, drawn-out, fun conversations, cerebral conversations. We didn't really get that. But then again, it's called the Primate Directive, so I can't be upset because I got I ordered a hamburger and I got a hamburger, so can't be too upset. Uh, so up- upon meeting the Enterprise crew, Taylor is immediately hey like let's like get this powerful Enterprise ship to destroy the apes. And then we'll take that back the planet for the humans. And Kirk's like, well, hold on a little bit, partner. There's something called the Prime Directive. That's a real thing. And we can't interfere with the planet's development. And so Taylor's like, look, I'm going to convince you. I'm going, we're going to have a cerebral, intelligent conversation about this. Just let me go back and get some friends. And I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's very gray area Prime Directive. Because, I mean, this is technically an Earth. There are humans they are being subjugated by mutants. And they're already kind of being interfered with by the Klingons. The Klingons are getting their hands all around in there. So why shouldn't the Enterprise help? You know, Taylor and these uh, humans that are just, like, living awful lives. It's definitely a gray area. It's tough to say. So Taylor tries to convince Kirk... That, hey man, just come back with me, meet my friends, Cornelius and Zira, and it'll all make sense. And after a lively argument, Kirk's like, I'm not doing that. I'm going to stay on my ship. I'm not meeting anybody. And Charleston Heston goes over the top, you know, with his gestures and his screaming and his flailing. And he stomps off on his way off the bridge, smacks Chekhov, and then bolts for it. And as he's bolting for it, he meets this epic mustache wearing transporter chief and smacks him down then steals this mustache's guy's clothes transporter chiefs and then he sneaks away into the darkness trying to find and steal a runabout a shuttlecraft which is interesting because he's never been on a starship before so well i guess he has he's an astronaut a surly one of that did they have runabouts i'm the one in wrong notes the children who are wrong anyway while he's out looking for a shuttlecraft, they actually get into this epic battle between Captain Kirk and Taylor. And it's exactly what you wanted it to be. It's exactly what I wanted from this series. A showdown between 1960s Charles and Heston and William Shatner. We have Taylor versus Kirk. And I mean, it's just every hard-hitting pow, double fist on the back of the neck, karate chop that you want and it's ridiculous, and we love it because it's campy, 60s sci-fi. It's exactly how you think it'll end up. They eventually, you know, end up on the same side after this initial dust-up, because that's just how things work in Star Trek, and that's what we're going to get. So you see them, like, throw down in the shuttle bay. you got the roundhouse punches kicking off of the walls, ripping shirts, bloody lips, the whole nine yards. And after all this violence, Kirk gives a very star trek speech and he says suppose i give you that shuttlecraft then what are you going to do with it it's starting from one ape city to the next destroying them giving vengeance for what they did to you one life at a time you're better than that and you're better than them <laughs> that was luna that probably was the worst william shatner impression i've ever done <laughs> It's like 11 o'clock, July 4th. So hopefully we can edit out all the booms and the pop rocks and all that kind of stuff that are going off in the background. Anyway, so Kirk gives us various, like, Federation recruitment peach to Taylor, and he's pacified, and they agree to go back down to the planet. 
and they get together with Cornelius and Zira, and they hatch a plan to stop this Klingon guerrilla alliance. And during this planning phase, Scotty just kind of randomly mentions a little bit of information about time travel. <laughs> we'll cover more of that later. So they beam Zira to the ape city to warn the ape leader, Dr. Sayas, of this guerrilla coup, and the loyal ape army rides out to stop the rebels from attempting this coup with these Klingon weapons. And the ancient law of ape shall not kill ape is preserved and victorious. There's no overthrow and the Klingons don't win. So this victory sets up General Ursus as the guerrilla leader. And that kind of leads us right into where Planet of the Apes sequel begins. And that is Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Nope, that's the title, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> so, meanwhile, the Enterprise crew, along with Taylor, Cornelius, Zira, they have a fist battle with the Klingons. And they go, all right, Klingons, time to get it. <laughs> and the Klingons eventually run with their tails between their legs, and they escape, and their plans are spoiled. And the crews actually, so the world is saved Planet of the Apes is will be preserved from Klingon interaction and interference. And I always thought, I was like, you think that Dr. Sayas' perception of humans would have changed now? Especially of Taylor. But let's not get into that, taking her serious hats off. And so Taylor and the Enterprise crew now can say goodbye. Everything's set right. And they actually invite Taylor to come with them, and Taylor goes, no. And so this is going to be my Charleston Heston impression about how Taylor responds to, to being invited back. And he goes, I left Earth for a reason, Kirk. I left because I thought that there had to be something better than human society. I thought your world is the same old Earth I left behind. Sure, the ships are faster, the weapons are more dangerous, but it's the same. I'm never going to fit in. And so they're about to say their goodbyes, but... Oh my gosh, the Klingons are back! And these embarrassed Klingons are saying, it's a good day to die, we're gonna go at them again and try to like, like little tussle, and they're quickly dispelled and killed, so thank God we can move on from this universe. And the Enterprise finally starts to go. And as they're flying away, we see the Planet of the Apes explode, an event that happens right at the end of Planet of the Apes 2, and again, spoilers and cons in context. So in Planet of the Apes 2, they go beneath the Planet of the Apes, hence the name of the movie Beneath the Planet of the Apes, and they find a cult of humans that worship atomic bombs and that Taylor destroys the Planet of the Apes at the end of the second movie, and that's what we see the Enterprise go at and completely undone ev is everything that just happened of any consequence in this entire comic series. So it wouldn't have mattered at all if they didn't do anything. So again, serious ads come off. But so our story ends with Cornelius and Zira escaping the planet in a ship, preparing to attempt the time travel technology and kind of mathematics that Scotty taught them, and thus setting up for the Planet of the Apes 3 escape from Planet of the Apes. It's all connected. <laughs> That's the primate directive. How did it all work out together? Honestly, a lot better than I expected. I mean, it's called the Primate Directive. It's silly. You have the campy fighting and, and the inspirational Starfleet recruitment speeches. So I couldn't be upset at all. I thought it was good. And I had a lot of fun reading it. And it kind of honestly made me want to go back and rewatch all of the Trek... Not Trek, sorry. That's a habit. Eight movies and see just how it could be and, and, and kind of see the implications now especially between one and two and two and three but i just think it's this is a fun comic series you know if you're a fan of both franchises definitely check it out uh, i've i've watched worse trek aka discovery than this comic series it's especially the art is really fun i think the episode cover art for this will have like some fun imagery that i found so please, if, you, if you're a fan, check it out. You can get it on Amazon, other things like that. I was talking to my wife and she was like, so is this like an ongoing thing? Do they have it for like the next generation and things like that? And I'm like, no, thank God. <laughs> just kidding. But this is just a mini series and it's, it's fun. And it's kind of like that crush at summer camp. You know, you, 
you kind of like hold hands and you and you share each other's snack on the soccer pitch and at the end of the summer you go your separate ways it was fun while it lasted but that's it and this is exactly what this episode and comic series is about did i wish they went into a little bit more deeper items and cool conversations about you know the cynicism of planet of the apes and how awful and humanity can be at its absolute worst and we destroy everything and on the opposite side we have humanity who gets rid of every disease issue problem socioeconomic everything's done everything's perfect in the in the track world so you have these massive franchises on different spectrums at the extremes i think it would have been fun for them to debate a little more but that's just me but however please check it out if you have a lot of fun but that has been our review of the primate directive luna let's count us down Thank you all so much for listening. I cannot wait for you guys to hear this. It's been a lot of fun reading and reviewing. And I just can't believe summer's here. Like I mentioned, it's July 4th here in the real world. So it's just crazy to me. And there's so many good movies coming out. And speaking of good movies, please check out www.jasontalksmovies.wordpress.com for all your funny and punny entertainment needs. And the link is in the episode description. No matter where you're listening on or through, the link is there, so check it out. I think he's doing one on Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which I still need to see, but his reviews are always top-notch, so please check it out. And as always, we have our Strange New World reviews coming out weekly. It's just about to start getting into the mid-season of Season 2 of Strange New World, so if you want to get caught up, now is the time. But as always... As we close today, please remember to take care of yourselves and one another and not let your heart be troubled. And second start of the right, straight on.